upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, us, said let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth. Say with me, over all the earth. God gave man dominion over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. I know a lot of creeps on the earth. How about you? You may be seated. Chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 15, says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But, and, and I want you to understand this was before that Eve was pulled from Adam. And the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden you may eat freely but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat thereof for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die okay now this was an instruction given from God to his son now I hear a uh, I hear a song on the radio all the time drives me crazy really because there are several biblical errors in the song uh it's on the christian station but uh the song is all wrong i always turn it over whenever i, I hear it because it talks about god's only son jesus being god's only son well i'm going to prove to you tonight that jesus is not and was not god's only son he was god's only begotten son that Adam or Adam was indeed uh, the son, a son of God. All right, now, chapter 3, I'm going to prove that to you in a second. Some of you are scratching your head saying, no, I don't think so. I'll prove it to you here in just a, just a second. In chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 6, it says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, now remember, the woman did not exist whenever God spoke with Adam and instructed him not to eat of the tree. So the woman can't be blamed here necessarily. Apparently, Adam wasn't as good a teacher as he needed to be because he should have passed along the word of God that God spoke to him to the woman. And so the woman, it doesn't say that the woman was ignorant, but it doesn't say that she wasn't. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the tree that, the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron, aprons. And they heard the voice of God, the Lord God, walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the, present of the, from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said to him, Where are you? Notice there that in, in verse 8 of chapter 3 that they hid themselves from God. They heard the voice of God. It wasn't that they did not hear the voice of God, but they, they hid themselves. In other words, they withdrew themselves from God. It was not God that withdrew himself from them. It was the man and the woman who withdrew themselves from the presence of God. And in so doing, man lost his dominion of the earth. And who did man give his dominion to? Of course, we all know that. He gave his dominion to the serpent. Then when Jesus died, that only begotten son of a virgin, 
who knew no sin but became sin so that we could become his righteousness. And he went to hell and claimed the keys to death, hell, and the grave so we did not have to go to hell. He gave us our dominion back. I'm about to prove that to you as well. First, let's go to Luke chapter 3. I told you I was going to prove something to you. Luke chapter 3, it's the genealogies. And Luke, how many of you just love to stay up late at night and read the genealogies? I'm going to, they really are, for, for geeks, they're great. Um, Luke chapter 3 and verse, I'll take you to the last two verses. Let's, let's put it that way. I'll, I'll take you to the last verse because that's the one. Can you back it up one to 37? Just for grins. I'll wait till you get there. Okay, there we go. Which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared. Excited yet? Which was the son of Malil, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of of God. Adam, I just proved to you there that Adam was the son of God. Now in Matthew chapter 16, let's flip over to Matthew 16. This is a Bible study. When Jesus came, God manifested himself in flesh and came to a virgin, came to a, he was born a child in a manger and he came to deliver something to us. And in Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, he did just that. Or he was prophesying about that in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. It says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that you are John the Baptist. Some say Elias. Others, Jeremiah. Or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Now, then he said something very, very important, one of the most important, and this is, something that I have, I have uh, showed to a lot, a lot of people, and almost no one realizes how important that this following scripture is. He said, and I say unto you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you, thee, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever that you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven so he was prophesying about whenever he was to be crucified whenever he was to be sacrificed and the sacrifice was to be made for all mankind what was going to happen after that which did happen after that in the book of Acts, chapter 2 and verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That was the revelation. He took the keys that Jesus gave him, and he gave them to all mankind. Jesus had went to hell and claimed man's dominion back. And he gave that dominion to Peter, that rock upon which he would build his church. And Peter founded the church. And he gave the keys. What did he do? He gave the keys to everybody. He said, for the promises to you, to your children, to all that are far off, I give you your dominion back. You do not have to live in bondage. You do not have to go to hell. 
I'm giving you your dominion back. You do not have to live underneath the thumb of the serpent. As if the serpents had thumbs, but... You can go tomorrow and talk in, at school or at work and say, my pastor said that snakes have thumbs. So that now we might have dominion over our lives. But most people ever never even take the keys. Most people in this world, the saddest thing in the world is that Jesus died to give us our dominion back. He died to give us the keys to his kingdom so that we might enter into it. And most people never even hear what I just taught you. The vast majority of Christians never have heard the message that I just taught to you. And many of those that do, they take the keys of dominion. Come here, brother. See, the serpent does have thumbs. They take the dominion that Jesus bought them and they give it right back to the devil. <laughs> he won't even drive a Ford. You know what the keys do? What did Adam have access to? God said that you have access to every tree in the garden, including the tree of life. He had access to immortality. And whenever Jesus went and he reclaimed, in the New Testament calls Jesus the second Adam. Whenever he went and reclaimed the dominion of the earth, he gave it back to man so that we would have access. In heaven, in Revelations, it talks about there's something that will be there that's very important to me and you, and it's the tree of life. So that we might also have life eternal. Now, you say, well, okay, I accept that Adam was a son of God. And I accept that, of course, Jesus is the only begotten son of God. But I'm going to, I'm going to, absolutely shatter some of your theology here and this comes with great power authority but this also comes with great responsibility because you understand that we are not animals how many of you understand that we are called to be children of God we are called to be sons. Now, don't think that I am a heretic here. I'm about to prove this too. Like Adam and like Jesus, we were called to be sons and daughters of the Most High God. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing that I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, Adam and Eve separated themselves, but they separated themselves from the wrong one. They ran from the God Almighty. They should have ran toward that voice. Romans chapter 8. I'll prove it to you again. Some of you said, I don't know about regular old people being sons and daughters of God. Well, let's read Romans chapter 8 and verse 14 says, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Through using the keys to the kingdom, 
By unlocking the door of the kingdom, we become sons and daughters of God. That's why the Bible calls us joint heirs with Jesus. What dominion and what authority does that give us in our lives? You just think about that. Adam had all authority over all the earth. He named every animal. He had complete, he was more or less the God of the earth. He had complete authority over everything. He was the Son of God. And of course we know that Jesus, all power in heaven and earth is given unto him. And he has given you dominion through giving you the keys to the kingdom. So why is it that on a, it would shock you to know how often I hear things like this. I feel like my faith is weak. I, I feel like my life is spinning out of control. I just can't seem to get ahead. The devil is wearing me out. The devil's winning. I've even heard this. I'm afraid to stir up the enemy. I'm so confused and my life is out of control. It is true that all Christians will be tried of the devil and at times you will be tried of God. And bad things do happen to good people. There's no doubt about that. But if your life is a perpetual chaos, then if, if your life seriously, if you can never seem to get ahead, if things are constantly off the rails, if you can't ever seem to color within the lines, everything that you do is wrong, and then you need to take a look and see who has dominion over certain aspects of your life. Now, my message tonight is called the order of dominion. And in the universe, there's a certain order to everything. There is nothing that is random. I, the more I study, and I'm, I'm, I, again, I'm a nerd. I like physics. I like astronomy. I like all these things. And, and I will tell you that it is all a grand design. Sir Isaac Newton, he was, by the way, a one God believer. He was more obsessed with the scripture than he was with physics. But he, and, and he said, I am just trying to figure out how God did it all. He's the father of physics. But we need to ask ourselves and look at our lives and say, who is in, in control of it? Our father in heaven, because we are the sons and daughters of God, amen, is not the father of any of these things. He's not the father of confusion. He is not the father of, of fear. He cast out all fear. He's the prince of peace. So who is in control? Who ha holds your dominion? Typically, this is how it goes. Okay, follow me for a second. Follow this logic. And I'm, I'm going to be brief tonight, promise. But follow this logic. Initially in the garden, God gave dominion to man, and man gave dominion to the devil, right? You with me? Then God said, okay, I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to take dominion back from the devil. So in this particular case, it was... God gave dominion to man. Man gave dominion to the devil. Then God gave, came and took dominion from the devil, gave it back to man, and then most of mankind has given it back to the devil. Who is in charge around here?
It is certainly not God in most cases. This world system is spiraling toward its own destruction. So it should be, here's how it should be. And I want you to get this if you don't get anything else. The order of dominion, the order that should be in our lives is that God gives man dominion and man gives it back to God. The steps of a righteous man are ordered of God. Even your steps as a son and a daughter of God, every step. You don't go anywhere by mistake. Brother Nathan, we were talking about it today. God puts him in places and houses to minister to people. You didn't go to anywhere by accident today. You didn't go anywhere to fix somebody's sink today. That's not why you were there. That may have seemed why you were there. But God ordered you to be there. If you are a righteous man or woman, God ordered you to be there. God did give us the keys so that we could make our own choices. But if we are led by His Spirit, we have given those keys back to Him. We have given our dominion back to Him. And we have given up control of our own lives and said, God, you lead me. You show me. And as long as I'm walking with God, as long as I'm allowing Him to lead me, I never go wrong. Do bad things happen sometimes? I never go wrong. Whatever aspects of your life seem to be perpetually out of control, I'm going to challenge you to do something. Because our lives have different facets to them. Whatever facet or aspect of your life that seems to be perpetually not what you want it to be, not what seems right for a, a son or daughter of God, I challenge you. Don't hide it from God like Adam and Eve did. They took their bodies and hid them from God. Don't hide that part of your, your being that you're unhappy with or is out of control. Expose it to God. Don't hide it from Him, but expose it to Him. Give it to Him. The, uh, you know, we, we really want to, anytime that we mess up, we want to, we have the same reflex that Adam and Eve did. Let's hide it. Let's not expose that to God. Let's act like it never happened. God will not miss us. You can never say, in this life, I've got this. You do not have this. You cannot handle this life. If you don't hand it over to God, you're in for a rough ride. It's like the, and I talk about the fishes and the loaves all the time, but what if that young man with the fishes and loaves had said, no, I don't have enough, I don't have enough to feed all you people. But he didn't, he gave it to God. He gave what he had, the meager amount that he had, and what did God do? Jesus took it, that Son of God. He took it, he blessed it, he broke it, and he multiplied it. And there is an order to all things, and dominion or control is no different. You know, I want you to listen to this. Faithfulness comes before blessing. It just does. And faithfulness can be a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things. Servitude comes before mastery. How many of you at 18 years old were a CEO? I don't know if we have any, we don't have any CEOs in here today. I don't know. But how many of you were the boss at 16 or 18 years old? 
you had to start as a servant to become a master. Servitude comes before mastery. You may be a son or daughter of God, but you know what? Whenever you're on this earth, what all we do on this earth is serve. And we will someday receive our reward. And he said, if you will become, if you will serve me in a few things, I'll make you master over many. And what we are commanded to do during this existence is to serve. There is no payoff before an investment. If you think you're going to win the lottery, good luck. You're still going to make an investment. That's not a very good investment at all. But you'll never receive a payoff until you have invested something. You will never reap until you have sowed. And why is it more blessed to give than it is to receive? It's because until you give, the scripture says, if you will give, then you shall receive. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. You'll receive many more times what you gave. And if that be of your money, if that be of your time, if that be of your energy, it's all giving. Therefore, to receive from God the dominion in our lives and peace in the middle of the chaotic storm, we must give the dominion of our life to him. We must be faithful servants who so in every aspect of our life to his ministry, in every aspect of our life to him. And we like to compartmentalize. We like to do what we call a separation of church and state, right? Well, the founders didn't see it that way. And we like to separate church from home, church from school, church from everything. Let's just separate church from absolutely everything else and see how that works out for you. The, uh, that, that's kind of, but actually we should be faithful servants, kingdom minded in every aspect of our life. So let's look at our lives for just a moment. I would like for us to all examine ourselves. Okay. And we will be as Adam and Eve were in the garden. We will stand naked before the mirror and we will examine ourselves for just a moment to see where the devil might have dominion in my life. For it is certain that if, if what we reap, we shall sow. And if we sow to the wind, we will reap the tornado. You will reap the whirlwind. So when the order of dominion gets out of order, what you have is disorder. And our lives become disorderly. So dominion, who has it? In our relationships, I was talking to a friend this past week who never seems to have the right relationship. It's like, well, have you prayed about that? Have you prayed for the right woman? Didn't think of that one. Have, are you fishing in the right pond? Or are you just casting out there on the internet and catching those <laughs> crazy fish. Have you asked God because in every, everyone who desires a spouse, I believe that God has an endless storehouse and he's got one that's just right for you. You need to ask him if you got, the scripture tells us, ask and you shall receive. In our marriages, those of you who are married, who's in control there? <laughs> she is. No. No. Who has, who has dominion in the marriage? Of course, the, the, the Bible lays out the, the order of things that we are to love our wives and the wives are to obey us. But you know what? If we truly love them, if we truly love our wives, we're going to listen to them. We're going to listen to their needs. We're going to care about their needs like God cares for us. He said, you know what? He knows our needs even before we ask. And how often is, is your wife going to have to obey you if you are caring, if you are 
already taking care of her needs before she asks. How, and, and you know, you know me, I've, I've preached about dating and never stopping dating uh, ever since I became pastor. And I think it's probably one of the very, very most important things that you can do for your marriage. How much time have you invested in your marriage? How much money have you invested in your marriage? Say all of it. <laughs> I've invested all my money in my marriage. How much affection? We're in the mirror here. Do you treat the people at work better than you treat your spouse? Do you treat the people at work of an opposite sex with more affection than you treat your spouse? Mine, mine, take out a farson. Like what? I am not speaking in tongues. Many marriages can see the handwriting on the wall. It says you have been measured in the balances and you have been found wanting. And let me tell you, there are a lot of Christian homes whose marriages are, have been found wanting. And we are made up, the church is built upon the family. The church can't survive unless the family does. Put God in control of your marriage. Give Him dominion in your marriage. And you know what you won't have? If, you've got, if you give God, if both the man and the woman give dominion to God, there will be harmony in that marriage. It won't matter who's in control if God's in control with your children who's in control of your children you say well my kids are crazy nobody's in control of them well they emulate you they do they can emulate some other people too but they're first looking to you to emulate them. They're looking to you to bring them to church, to teach them about God, to more importantly, or at least as importantly, to live a godly life before them. Because we are, after all, living epistles. You can say, you can talk a good game, but if you don't live it, they're going to know what you are, which is a hypocrite. Now, nobody's perfect. And your kids know you as well as anybody. Nobody's perfect, but they know whether you're for real. They know if you're living for God, if you're headed in the right direction. They know who is in charge of your life. They're depending on you to teach them. And listen to me for a second. They're depending on you to discipline them. A nursery is a great place to have in a church. A nursery, by its very name, is a place where nursing mothers go to breastfeed their children. It should not be a reform school, a church-funded reform school for unruly children. There's a place for that, too, called the woodshed. I'm not joking. Your kids are dis depending on you for discipline. I have raised a son who the first couple of few years of his life, I thought, my goodness, what is ever going to happen with this boy? He's not here tonight. He had to go back to college. And I had a friend of mine. I said, you know, I, I spank him. And it doesn't seem to really, and, and, and lock me up if you need to. Go for it. Call DHS, Humane Society, whatever. But a friend of mine said, just keep on. And at some point, you won't need to. And I said, what I'm doing doesn't seem to be working. He said, don't stop doing what you're doing. Just keep on, and eventually... You won't have to. And I'll, 
you know, you talk about your kids, you get all choked up. And, and my kids aren't perfect. Don't, don't put them up against your kids. I don't want any of that. No, no, no. PKs have it hard enough. But he was right in that. And that I have no problem with him. He has faults. I have my faults. But I have no problem with him. As a matter of fact, he's a very good son. For a reason. Because I didn't quit. You want to know why nobody wants to work the nursery? So if your children will not behave in church, you can use my office to fix that problem. They will eventually get it. In your finances, do you always struggle? And no matter how much you make, it never is, seems to be enough. Malachi said that you're trying to save money with a bucket full of holes. If I don't give of, of my finances, and I've said this before, if I take, if I can get it out of my pocket, if I take this and, and the Lord says, Jim, Adam, where are you? And I go, nothing to see here. You are taking his hand. God, because God wants to bless his children. You tell me that God has sons and daughters that he does not want to bless. Now I can't get it out of this pocket. But you are taking his hand. And you are pulling it away. You're pulling the financial blessings away from your finances. And you can believe that or don't believe it. You'll not ever know it until you try it. But I'll promise you this. Whenever you bless the kingdom of God financially, you'll be blessed. Given it shall be given unto you. Let's turn that, let's flip that upside down. Withhold. Can, can you all finish the rest of that? If you don't give, it will not be given unto you. There's an opposite meaning to every scripture. Given it shall be given unto you. That shall is a very important word, very powerful word. Okay, withhold and it shall not. Simple as that. My home. Is God's name used in my home in praise or in vain? And you say, well, I don't use the Lord's name in vain. Well, does your television. Is there all types of immorality and, and near pornography and all types of lasciviousness and immorality going on in your living room or in your bedroom in your house question mark we're standing in the mirror i would i would tell you this the home is where it all starts the the church you can't live without a church but the home is where it all starts and if you've got this hell going on in your house then a, that's no place for a son or a daughter of god you know, Jesus went to hell for a reason to get the, the keys, but he didn't stay. He didn't say, well, I oh, think I'll make myself at home. You can't live in hell and be a son and daughter of God. You can't stay. You can't choose Sodom, and you can't stay there like you preached a few weeks ago. If you're going to be a son or daughter of God, you've got to get out of Sodom. With my health. Wait a second. We're still in the mirror here. With my health. You say, man, where did he get all this stuff? Stay out of my life, preacher. Don't step on my toes. Don't get into where I live. Too personal. Okay, I'm going to tell you anyway. 
I want to eat whatever I want to eat whenever I want. I want to eat whatever I want to eat whenever I want to eat it. If I want a, a fried chicken and cheeseburger six times a day, that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to smoke whatever, whenever. I'm going to drink whatever, whenever. And I'm going to exercise never. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost? You either, there's two words here. There's a word consecrate. And there's a word called desecrate. And they mean the opposite of one another. And you are either doing one or the other with your body. You are consecrating it unto God as the temple of the Holy Ghost, or you are desecrating it. So I encourage you to consecrate the temple. Don't desecrate it. We live in a society of instant gratification. It's the me first. Please stand with me. Any of you ever heard? Get it your way right away. This is what our children have been raised on. I want it all and I want it now. No boundaries. Got the urge? Just do it. Why wait? And you think about that and you, you look at those. Those are all slogans that you will go home and hear tonight. And you think about, yeah, those kids these days. Those kids. Remember who they're emulating. You ever heard the song? You ever, you ever heard? If you can't be with the one you love, then love the one you're with. I've never heard it. What about pa saying slogans like patience is a virtue? Ask not what you can do for your country or what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Hard work pays off. Quality takes time. Get back on that horse. Quitters never win. Nobody owes you anything. If you don't succeed, try, try again. These slogans, these sayings, reflect moral, godly, servitude-like values. And in order for us to ever gain dominion in our lives, for, in order for that order of dominion to be ever made complete in our lives, for ever, us to ever truly become the sons and daughters of God. We've got to give him dominion in every aspect of our lives. And if you have seen the handwriting on the mirror in any one of these areas or any other area of your life that says, Mine, Mine, take a farsan. We need to change. I need to change. We all need to change. St. Jude chapter 1. And I'm closing right here. I'm sorry this hadn't been a chandelier swinging good time. But I really love Bible study, don't you? It's where I grow. It's where, where, I, where I'm nourished is learning how I should live. You know, we're happy when we live the way that God wants us to live. Whenever I turn over all of these aspects of my life to God, I'm, I'm happy. Everything's not perfect, but I'm happy. St. Jude chapter 1, verse 20. Very, very powerful. If you've never read Jude, read Jude. But ye, beloved, build up yourselves on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, 
making a difference. How many of you want to make a difference? I don't only want to survive this world. I want to make a difference in it. I want to, I want to take somebody with me. You know what? Everybody wants to leave the world a little better. I want to, I want to take somebody to heaven. I want them to have to build another mansion up there for somebody else. In this last verse, or the last few verses, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, (laughs) our Savior, be glory and majesty and what dominion and power both now and forever amen i want to give dominion to our lord and savior right now i want him to have dominion in my life now and forever amen If we give him dominion of our lives now, then he's going to be able to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. I don't want, whenever I stand before God, and you know we've stood before a mirror tonight, but you're going to stand before something more powerful than even a mirror. There's going to be a day that Me and you and every person on this planet stand before a holy God. I want, I want whenever he gives a report of me and of you, I want him to do it with exceeding joy. And I want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, we love you tonight. I pray, Lord God, that we would take this word and we would eat it. We would consume it. That we would know your voice. We would know the voice of the shepherd. And that whenever you call our name, that we would not hide anything from you. But we would bring ourselves before you. We would ask you to search our hearts. To see if there be any wicked way in us. And if there be any wicked way in us, give us conviction. Send us conviction so that we might change our ways. We might consider our ways. And that we might become holy and acceptable unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. I do have a quick announcement that uh, we're getting the new sound system next week. Two weeks early. And uh, also, the big, big business meeting is next Wednesday, February the 3rd. Don't miss that. And we're going to be taking some votes uh, on some important items next week. So all of you that are tuning in online, we'll give you instructions on that uh, Sunday on how to do that. And uh, don't forget prayer meeting at 930 on Sunday mornings before church. Also, uh, I need to make a very important uh, announcement that we on sat this Saturday will be moving in Anna, but it's not at eight o'clock in the morning. We can't we can't get the truck here before then. It's going to be at ten o'clock in the morning next Saturday. Oh, okay, February sixth. I'm sorry. Yep, not this Saturday. Next Saturday, February sixth at ten, not eight. So um, just keep that in mind, and uh, we'll get over there and get Anna. Anna moved on to her next uh